I am the next speaker and the last speaker. I try to be very effective, but try to be came calm. Uh, as I mentioned in my former presentation, the question was when I started my research that whether this d theorem has any role in living organism or not. Uh, before I show a couple of clinical results, I will show a couple of preclinical results. Uh, to, to follow the cell growth in a different lutein depleted water, we use the most uh, developed technique. It means that the cells were growing on a gold layer and we don't need to uh, label or we don't need to manipulate with the cells just following how the impedance of this gold layer is changing. And that was correlated with the uh, growth rate of the cells. So we prepared water media, 150 ppm to 40 ppm. Uh, and the question was whether there is any relationship between the deuterium concentration of the media and the cell growth. And here are the three different cell lines, breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma. And maybe the best is the lung cancer. As you see, 150 ppm could go the faster way, the cells. And as we reduce the day concentration, we can inhibit the cell growth or we completely could stop even in here. Uh, in the next slide and the next experiment, we wanted to show how sensitive can be the cell for the changing deuterium level. So in that experiment, we changed the deconcentration in 0, 1.1 1 ppm, 2.5, and 5 ppm every eight hours. Uh, it means we started 150, then 150, 150, 150, or 149, 48, 47, 46. And as you see, even the green, green light which means some ppm reduction every eight hours result in a lower growth rate, suggesting that the cells immediately recognize that something is different and there is a reduction in the deconcentration. Uh, our plan is to integrate deuterium depletion into the oncotherapy. So we tested a couple of uh, uh, chemotherapic agent. Here you can see that this is the growth rate of the cells in normal water. This is the growth rate in the cells in the deuterium depleted water with 85 ppm. These two curves show the growth rate of the cells treated with doxorubicin, which is a commonly used chemotherapic agent. And that was the results and we used both at the same time. Uh, and all the clinical trial, all the results I will show, I can say this is a results of the combination of the conversion therapy plus deuterium depleted water. Uh, only one or a couple of in vivo study. We transplanted mice with PCC3 uh, prostate cancer cell lines. Uh, for 18 days, both groups consumed normal water. After that, we changed the normal water for the depleted water in the treated group. And two days later, we killed animals in which I, and we counted the cells being in mitosis and apoptosis in the tumor. Uh, Macroscopically, we saw that in the, treat in the control group there was a fast-growing tumor. After this uh, treatment, we have a much smaller and very bowl-shaped tumor. And when we checked the cells being in mitosis, it was just almost the opposite in the treated arms, suggesting that the depleted water triggered apoptosis in that mice study. Uh, at the very beginning of our study, we uh, uh, asked the vets to use deuterium depleted water to treat dogs and cats. Uh, we have a drug register for veterinary use, and here is a couple of dogs and cats treated with deuterium depleted wa water, either alone or with combination with uh, surgery. And what we can say, roughly 50% of the animals we can cure with deuterium depleted water. Uh, additional 20-30% of the animals respond well, and we can see a partial response. Uh, this is another uh, example. This is a hemangiosarcoma sarcoma on the neck of the, of the dog. That was the results of the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and started to kill the animals. Uh, hopefully, our vet uh, was, was invited to treat this, this, this uh, dog, and we started the treatment. That was a four-week treatment. That was 10 weeks treatment, and that was 14 weeks treatment, and uh, dog became completely tumor free. And this is not the only th uh, dog which was treated that way and we got the same results. And here's a veterinary drug with what I have mentioned. So we can get 50% uh, 
we could say complete response, and we can get additional 20, 30 percent uh, uh, response rate, uh, partial response. That water contains 25 ppm deuterium. Our one of the aim is to to develop uh, injection formulation from uh, deuterium depleted water. We have initiated the trial at the EMA, and we hope that uh, starting a clinical trial, uh, we can uh, register this uh, injection formulation as an anti-cancer drug for veterinary use. Okay, uh, going to the clinical trials with the human clinical trials, we were lucky to to complete one phase two clinical trial, which was a randomized double-blind clinical trial. In that trial, we evaluated 44 patients. The trial lasted for four months, and the treated group consumed water with 85 ppm, the placebo group consumed water with 150 ppm. Uh, and of course, the inclusion criteria was histologically confirmed prostate cancer. When we checked the PSA value at the end of the four-month study, we found that in the treated arm, the PSA dropped to dropped by 80 percent. It was only 47 percent in the uh, placebo group. When we checked the changes of prostate volume, the prostate volume, cumulative prostate volume, reduced with 160 cube centimeter in the treated arm, and that was only 54 uh, cube centimeter in the placebo arm. But it was maybe more important when we checked uh, the survival after one year, and the trial lasted only for four months. So we found that in the treated arm, we lost two patients, but we lost nine in the placebo arm, suggesting that those were very lucky who were treated with deuterium depleted water in the study. And, and uh, of course, there was uh, significantly higher the survival rate and the, sur uh, and the survival time and the death rate was low, uh, lower in uh, treated arm. Uh, as, as you know, to, to register a drug, it, it costs a lot. And unfortunately, our background wasn't so strong to finance uh, uh, clinical trials by clinical trials. So we tried to solve that problem uh, following patients who had been consuming the routine depleted water. And that way, we have published a couple of papers, and I, I would show a couple of uh, results from these uh, results. From 1992, we, I started personally to collect and to talk with people consuming DDW. And we collected a couple of data. So we know the data of the diagnosis. We know the type of tumor. We know the date of start of DDW. We know the end of this DDW treatment. We know the end of the follow-up because we got feedback after even the people has stopped consuming DDW. Uh, and we followed, of course, the response during the DDW treatment. And at the end of the follow-up, we could record whether patients were alive or has died. As I mentioned, the enrollment started in 1992. It, it, it was, that database was closed 2014. And I will show you the results of 1,820 seven patients. Uh, a minimum criteria was that at least these should consume for one day deuterium depleted water. Uh, we had over 1,000 women, uh, almost 800 men. Average age was 45, uh, 54, and the body weight was uh, close to uh, 70 kilogram. Uh, before going into detail, let's see the numbers in the United States, the prevalence of different tumors. In the United States, there is diagnosed every year 1.6 million uh, new cancer patients. And you can see the prevalence of the different main tumor types. These numbers are the prevalence of the patient ha had been followed. And these are the prevalence of the DW population uh, within this 1,827 patient. And as you see that the most frequent uh, five tumor types is very close the prevalence of of the between the us and the dw population so we could say that within that population the tumors are represented roughly the same way as it appear in 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 different country or well, let's say for example in the united states uh, we know the bad news that <clears throat> 
even in the United States, every year uh, they lost almost 600,000 patients because they die of cancer. In our population, we lost uh, 400, 877 uh, patients. Uh, that was 35% uh, of the newly diagnosed patient. That was 26% of our population. And as you see from this number, roughly every third year in the United States, the, they are lost so many people which is diagnosed in one year newly. So that should be in your mind how unfortunately how many people die and how frequently and how fast they can die. Okay, so when we see our results, we can say that this uh, over 1,800 patient, the cumulative follow-up period is almost 7,000 years. Unfortunately, there were almost more than 3,000 years from the diagnosis till the end of, till, still the start of DDW treatment. The patient consumed uh, cumulatively over 2,000 years, the DDW. Uh, our follow-up from the start of DD treatment is almost 4,000 years. These are a very specific date and we can calculate a couple of things from these numbers. If we don't do anything else, just follow the median survival time of these almost 2,000 patients. In our case, is 10.1 years. I cannot show you any proper control group uh, which has not been consumed DW, but from the numbers that 600,000 people die in the United States out of uh, 1.6 million newly diagnosed, you can figure out what could be the, the average median survival time for the population which is not consuming in depleted water. We try to figure out a couple of correlations which can be good, but kind, but should be followed to get the best response. Of course, we check the correlation between the length of DDW treatment and the survival time. Uh, there are a couple of numbers on this picture, but I try to explain. So this the numbers means the median survival time, and this column uh, shows the median survival time of 1,827 patients. We found that 34 patients consumed less than 30 days, the DW, so we leave them out, and we had 1,793 patients. The median survival time was 120 months. And then we leave out 40 one patient because they consume less than 60 days. And as we go further, here we can see a gem because those who consume longer than 120 days, here we can get 15 months, uh, we can find a longer sur median survival time with 15 months. And as we see, the people are consuming longer the DW, the median survival time is increasing. The next uh, slide, the same question, another uh, uh, approach. Here we find over 500 patients, they consume the DW between 91 days and 180 days. The median survival time was 56 months. Those who consume an additional three months, it goes up to 74 months, and those who consume longer than nine months, here we got the median survival time. So I, I would say it's not a big surprise, the people longer consume DW, the longer they will live. Uh, that was the Kaplan-Meier curve based upon this uh, three group of patients. Uh, the other question can be, and, and key factor, when, the pe when can a cancer patients start DW therapy? Uh, in that case, we say, what is the median survival time for those patients who started the DW treatment within one year after they were diagnosed, within one, two years, and over two years? And it was, again, not a big surprise. Those who started earlier and within one year after the diagnosis, the median survival time was almost 100 months. Those who started two years later, it was just half of this uh, number. And that was the kaplan meyer curve of, the, of this patient. Uh, I can show you a small, very homogeneous group of patients with the same uh, uh, aspect. When we checked the 232 breast cancer patient and we addressed the same question, 
whether they started uh, within one year or later than one year, the uh, DDW therapy, we could find here we were not able to calculate the median survival time because out of 114 patients, we lost 18. It means that we lost one patient every 20 uh, second years uh, because the cumulative follow-up was almost 400 years for these patients. Uh, and those who were uh, started did treatment later than one year, then the median survival time was 49 months. The question can be, how can we establish the optimal DW dose? Uh, there are a couple of parameters which can influence. We know that the body weight of the patient is different, that they consume different amount, and can be another aspect. So here's the formula what I, I, I suggest to use. If we consider that the uh, deuterium content of the water, regular water, is 150 ppm, minus the DDW uh, concentration in ppm, that we multiply with the volume of the water they consume and divide with the body weight, we will get a number. Here is an example. If the body weight is 60 kilogram, patient consume 1.6 liter, and the deconcentration is 65 ppm, then we could say D, the unit is 2.3. But if someone is a higher body weight, smaller uh, volume, higher PPM, then the dosage will be 0.7 D, the unit. So these numbers are quite comfortable and we can uh, calculate them. The next slide shows just because the body weight can influence the D, the unit. So we checked what is the correlation if we make a for groups of people depending on their body weight. And here you can see that patient being between 31 and 60, 30, uh, 60 kilogram, the median survival time was 131 months. And those who were over 100 kilograms, it was 56 months. Uh, it, it is obvious. So in, in our clinical trial, it is an exclusion criteria, the body weight. We never will enroll a patient in the clinical trial over 100 kilograms because we will ruin our uh, clinical trials. So the optimal, okay, let's go in detail. Uh, as I mentioned, we had 232 breast cancer patients. Out of these patients, we had 74 patients who were in a stage four. These 74 patients had uh, metastasis in 135 organs, so one of the women has only one organ couple of them, two or three, or even there was one who had uh, uh, metastasis and five different organs. And uh, we checked each of the patient, each of them the body weight, each of them the volume of the DW they consume, and the PPM of the water. And we checked the response during that period. And then we made two groups of people, those where the DD unit was bigger than one, or equal or smaller than one. And when we checked it, we could see that those who, where the DD unit was higher than one, 70% of them showed complete response or partial response. When it was smaller than one, 70% showed no change or progression of disease. Then we played with the DD unit and went down to 0.6, and that was the lowest where we still got some uh, significant differences between the complete and partial response versus no change and progression of disease. So what we, we can say that the DD unit should be about one, it's even higher. Uh, in the next couple of slides, we show you a very, very homogeneous population and uh, calculating the median survival time. And in that case, I can show you very uh, precise historical control. So the out of the phase two double uh, clinical trial, we have 91 additional prostate cancer patients. Uh, 46 of them had metastasis, uh, distant metastasis. 33, the metastasis was limited only for the bone. 32 of them was adenocarcinoma. 20 of them had bone metastasis within one year after the diagnosis. The median survival time was 64.8 months. The historical contrary is 15, 20 months. So in that case, we can get a threefold increase in median survival time. When we check the other population, 12 patients, the 
bone metastasis appeared later than a year after the diagnosis. Here we were not able to calculate the median survival time. Uh, cumulative follow-up was over 100 years. Uh, 12 people belongs to that, and two of them died. So every 51 years, we lost one patient. And if we go there, those prostate cancer, cancer patients, uh, they were tumor-free. Uh, I mean metastasis free. Uh, in that case, we also were not able to calculate the median survival time. Cumulative follow-up was uh, 157 years. Four patients died, so we lost uh, uh, one every 39 years one patient. If you go to the lung cancer, uh, without any selection, small cell, non-small cell, metastasis in brain or whatever, uh, we had 304 uh, lung cancer patients, and the median survival time was 48 months, uh, the historical control about 8, 10 months. Okay, going into detail, it was interesting that we find a big difference between the male, uh, the gender. For women, we could find 87 months, and for men, it was 40 months. Earlier, we published paper uh, that we could find some correlation between the genes having key role in the lung cancer development and with, with the mice study where we studied how can we modify the gene expression of genes having key role in, in lung cancer development. And that was different in mice, in, in males and females. The very good point, I would say, that when I compare the results that we have today with the results that we have five years ago, uh, so at 2010, we could have evaluated uh, 129 lung cancer patients. And that time for, for male, the median survival time was 25.9 months. For women, it was uh, 74.1 months. But today, we could say it, it was 40 months and uh, 87 months. So there was quite a good improvement. And I do hope that we can even increase that median survival time. Uh, and why can we get so good results? I would show a, a, a picture. So that lady was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2001, uh, uh, July. Later, it turned out that this is a small cell lung cancer with a brain metastasis. At that time, uh, her daughter was said to survive for two additional months. Uh, she received the conventional therapy and started to consume DDW. Uh, that MRI was made three months later. In October, there is a reduction in the uh, tumor size. Uh, that was made uh, 23 months later, and this is the rest of the tumor. That was made uh, 43 months later. You can still have something which is not a tumor. And uh, also the primary tumor has, has gone. She, she died 11 years later, so not two months. And, and uh, this is the reason that we can say that the median survival time was, was uh, we can get a tenfold increase for the lung cancer population. If you go to the breast cancer, we, we, again, if you see the whole population, the median survival time is 12 months, 12 years. And again, I, I, I mentioned that we had two big groups, and uh, this is the question of staging. So the 74, which started in a late stage, and the other started in an early stage. Uh, it was clear that those started in an early stage. We have a median survival time over 200 months, and those that I mentioned, late stage is 52 months, a historical contour is 20, 24 months. So here again, got a two to three-fold increase in median survival time. And two, two more, and uh, one of the worst tumor type is pancreas. And uh, with uh, Professor Boros, we went to the ACI conference last year in San Diego, and this is the results that we could present it. So we had uh, 18 patients who started within 16 days after the diagnosis of uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. And here we could find uh, 39 months median survival time. Those who started later than 60 days, the median survival time was 16 months. And the historical contour is, is, is extremely poor, six to seven months. Uh, and the, the, the worst tumor type, we would say the glioblastoma. 
In that case, we had 34 tumor, uh, patients and our median survival time is 26 months. The historical contrary is four to seven months. Okay. So the question that I would like to cause that part of my presentation, uh, the next question can be, can deuterium depleted water prevent cancer? We know that from one cell, which is healthy, we've got a, a one centimeter tumor. It typically takes four or five years. So there is a change in the me metabolism, in changes in the genome. There is a group of cells which is not healthy, not tumorous, later additional changes in the metabolism and, and genome. And finally, we got a small group of tumorous cells. Uh, when this group of cells size reached the one millimeter in diameter, the growth will stop because the cells in the middle of the millimeter cannot get uh, nutrition and oxygen by diffusion. So they are waiting and sending signals to the vessels to grow into the tumor. When the tumor can solve that problem, then they will have you know, food and oxygen and they will grow. So we have plenty of time to eliminate this group of cells and that way we could uh, uh, reduce the incidence of cancer. The other critical part is that the tumor give metastasis. So by the time when the tumor uh, patient is operated and even the primary tumor has removed, uh, we know that millions of cells has left the primary tumor and unfortunately later the metastasis appear. So in the very first experiment, we checked whether we can modify the migration of the cells, changing the deconcentration. Here we use the same sophisticated system, so I wouldn't go into detail, but as you see, there was a strong correlation in the migration and the deconcentration. When we reduce the deconcentration, we could inhibit uh, the migration of these cells. That was the breast, that was the melanoma cell lines. Uh, this uh, results also came with collaboration with Professor Boros. Uh, he knows better than me, but the point is, if we check the ratio between the glyc glycogen, deoxyribose, and ribose, this is typical for a cancer cell line. So it means the mere pancreatic cancer cell in a normal deuterium uh, 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 water give a typical phenotype of the ratio between glycogen, uh, glycogen deoxyribose, and ribose. But when we change the deconcentration and we reduce, that is typical for healthy cells. So simply changing the deconcentration, we could influence the metabolism of these cells, and that would be one example that we can modify and uh, push the metabolism to the right direction. We also made another experiment. It is well known that when we treat the mice with a carcinogen agent, that will uh, trigger the expression of, of a, a couple of genes having key role in tumor development. So we treated the mice with a dimethylbenzantracine, and uh, one group consumed normal, the other DW, and we checked the expression of these genes. So these are the mice consuming normal water, mice consuming normal water plus treated with a carcinogen agent, and all these gene expression increased rapidly, uh, and uh, when the mice was treated with uh, DW, treated with DW plus a carcinogen agent, we could suppress it. That was in collaboration with Zolta Gyöngyi at the University at, at Page. And we, we did a long run study. Uh, we used the same uh, carcinogen agent. We uh, treated 48 mice, two groups were treated, 24 normal water, 24 DDW. And we found that after 150 days, the tumor appeared in the control group. And here we lost uh, 18 animals. In the treated group, we lost two animals by that time when we stopped thinking, giving them DDW. Uh, it is also known that the COX-2 gene and the oxygen is, is considered as a, as, as a gene, as a target to prevent cancer. So we, we checked it, whether DW can influence the expression of these genes and the COX-2 enzyme. Uh, this is an in vitro study when we followed the cell growth of HT29 colon tumor cell line. This is the growth rate in normal water. And the correlation uh, in DW, the growth rate was, and the cell growth was inhibited. Uh, at the same time, we checked the uh, COX-2 uh, genes, and we could find that uh, reducing the deconcentration, we could uh, 
uh, reduce the content of the COX-2 enzymes, and at the same time, we could measure the prostaglandin level, and there was a strong correlation, so we suppressed the gene, we suppressed the enzymes, and uh, that resulted in a, a lower uh, prostaglandin concentration. So the conclusion of that part of uh, my speech would be DDW can uh, reduce the migration of the tumor cells, DDW has impact on metabolism, DDW inhibits the expression of genes having key role in tumor development, and that way the DW can be the first drug which could be used for, for prevention because there were a couple of drug uh, chemotherapy agent tried to use it as a preventive agent. They could reduce also the risk of uh, uh, cancer, but a couple of times they killed a patient who was uh, finally healthy. So that deuterium depletion can be a, a so-called drug candidate which can have a key role in, the, in prevention cancer. Uh, we can also address the question whether curable the cancer. Uh, we have two, we can make two big groups out of these 1,827 patients. Typically, we can say 106,056 patients started to consume DW with tumor. But we had 171 patients who started in a tumor-free stage. The cumulative fallout was over 6,000. The cumulative fallout was here 800 years. In that case, we calculated median survival time uh, uh, nine years. Here we were not able. And this is very important data. So if you see those who started in tumor-free stage, they started roughly within one year. And the bad news is that most of these patients were tumor-free when they, they were diagnosed and they were treated with operation, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. But they started DW treatment therapy after 646 days. It means they have relapsed or they were in a late stage. In our case, uh, those who started with, uh, with uh, tumor, the tumor, we lost over 400 patients. It means comparing to this cumulative follow-up time, we lost one patient as did 12 years. But in that case, we lost only 11 patients. That was only 6.4% of, of this population. It means we lost seven, every one patient every 72 years. So this is quite a long period of time, I, I would say. A and it means that, I would go here, so that would be the protocol we would suggest. Here is a diagnosis. We suggest to start DW therapy as, soon, as close as possible to the diagnosis and parallel with the conventional therapy. In an optimal case, we can get a remission. We do not suggest stop drinking, keep drinking, and after a while, patients can make a break. That break should be short, let's say three to four months, at the beginning, then even they are fine, start to consume again DW. Then they can make a break, and that break can be longer, and start again. And I would show what is the difference when someone consume only once the DW, and the others consume in a repeated times. So here are again the breast cancer population. 108 of them consumed only once. This is the survivor curve. And those who repeated several times the DW therapy, the median survival time was 24 years. And that's, again, a big difference. OK, this is what I have told you. Uh, you can address what is the mechanism, how deuterium depletion work, and what is the role of, of deuterium depletion. Uh, you don't know that the reason we are here uh, is Albert St. Uh, Professor Boss also cited him. He, he visited Hungary 40 years ago, he, he, and he said two sentences, I remember. First, he said that if you want to, cancer if you want to solve the cancer problem, you have to do submolecular level, and he uh, suggested and check the electrons. And the other sentence, he said, you need two lamps. You need a green and the lead ramp 
to regulate the cell regulation. We have talked about the red lamp. That was what Professor Boros said. I would say the red lamp is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is producing deuterium depleted water, and if the mitochondria are working properly, keep the D level low. But the cell can multiply. And uh, here are a couple of side, uh, slides that I had hypothesized 20 years ago when we published our first paper. So at that time, I could read in the literature that uh, before the cells start to multiply, there is the activation of the sodium hydrogen transport system, and everybody accepted that there is a shift in the pH because uh, the cells take up a sodium and throw out the hydrogen. And there was a paper published in the Nature. Uh, in the Nature, uh, they said that they isolated the hydrogen ATPase. They used the genes to transfer the animal cell line. And everybody was surprised that that cells became tumorous. So simple ATPase gene was, was used, and that cell line became tumorous. Uh, our hypothesis was, so when the growth, growth hormone binds to the membrane, that will stimulate the hydrogen transport system. And I would say that we we'll prefer to eliminate the hydrogen, which means the DH ratio will change in the cell. And that should be the signal for the cell, what to do and what not to do. So when we use deuterium depleted water, or the cells work properly, the cells are not able to lift up the DH ratio to the threshold, no signal, and that can lead up to, the, to kill the tumor cells. The good news is that I had found a paper which says that the hydrogen ATPs do not accept deuterium as a substrate. So in, in life, the proteins and the living organism is so sophisticated that that can discriminate between the sodium, between the deuterium and hydrogen. And to check the sodium hydrogen transport system, we, we, we run an experiment. Uh, we, we made an acid load of an animal cell line and we checked the recovery of these cell lines in normal water and deuterium depleted water. And, and what we found was that in a normal water and deuterium depleted water, the recovery was different. So somehow the amylase sensitive sodium hydrogen antiport recognized the DH ratio and they were working according to the DH uh, deuterium concentration. And, and remember my former presentation, I, I, I mentioned that I will come out with this uh, uh, slide. So when we use diabetic patients, they consume water with 104 ppm, and after 90 days, we could find a significant decrease in, in the sodium level in the blood. And I would say that when someone consumes DW, that will stimulate the sodium hydrogen antiport, and that resulted that we could find a lower sodium concentration in, the, in this patient. And from that hypothesis also come out that if we help the cells with the deuterium, it, it's much easier for the cells to, to lift up to the threshold and that should stimulate the cell growth. And this is what we found. So when we goes up to 200, 300 and 500, that stimulated slightly the cell growth. And that was also what Dr. Roman mentioned, what we published earlier, that that was 150 ppm, 300 ppm, 600 ppm, up over 600 ppm, the isotopic effect became dominant and it's inhibited the cell growth. So combining all these results, that should be my uh, uh, conclusion. There is a mitochondria and the mitochondria communicate with the cytosol. And there is a, a balance between these uh, two pieces of the cells. When a properly working the mitochondria, as I we discussed it, that can keep the deconcentration low. But from outside, there are different signals coming to the cells, and when a growth hormone binds, that will stimulate this membrane transport system, which will trigger and change the DH ratio. And there are different situations. So when the uh, mitochondria are working properly, I would say that changes can happen only temporarily for a couple of minutes or maybe uh, longer. But that would be enough to trigger the cell multiplication and the cell will multiply in the right way. But when the mitochondria is damaged and no red lamp, then very easy for the cells 
to increase the DH ratio, uh, the gross hormone binding and do any break. So it's very easy for the cell to increase the DH ratio to a threshold and the cell will multiply. And this is how the cancer cell can grow because no break, but there is a red light and that way they can go very fast and they do not take care of any environmental. And at least but not last, our primary aim is to have a new anti-cancer drug based upon duty and depletion. So our company has just completed a facility which is able to produce duty and depleted water in a pharmaceutical company. We have uh, passed the audit of the authority. So this, where we boil the water, this is the bottom of the column, and that uh, uh, facility is able to produce duty and depleted water in accordance to the GMP rules if we got the, the, the label and the, uh, the guarantee. Uh, here we can collect the duty and depleted water, what we send to the uh, grade D clean rooms, uh, we finalize the PPM concentration, we add back the salts, and at the end we can uh, uh, bottle the water. So our company uh, has registered duty and depleted water at the EMA as an active substrate. Here's the duty and depleted water. And we have uh, finalized uh, our protocol, which will be about the chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And, and we do hope that we can find the right uh, uh, clinics and within a short period of time, we can enroll the patient. And hopefully at the end of this uh, clinical trial, we can uh, show and we can confirm, which is evident for me for 20 years, but there are, uh, we need some additional evidence. So we do hope uh, we are very close to the stage that we can say deuterium depletion is a very effective way to intervene and oncology should integrate into the cancer therapy that kind of approach. Thank you very much for your attention.